Now, um, the inclusion of Aboriginal perspectives here was mainly to help the court figure out what an appropriate sentence might have been, or to make a judgment about the sentence, okay? Um, so it doesn't return quite to the depth of understanding of the centrality of K.I.'s connection to the land as expressed in the first decision. The Court of Appeal also centers the conflict between the Mining Act <coughs> and the Crown's obligation to respect 30 Section 35. The Court of Appeal called the Mining Act a remarkably sweeping law. It establishes a free entry system whereby all Crown lands, including those subject to Aboriginal land claims, are open for prospecting and staking without any consultation or permitting required. Okay. So while the Mining Act was not declared unconstitutional, that wasn't before the Court, the Court of Appeal's comments about it were quite pointed. Um, the Court of Appeal released its decision on July 7th of that year, and Ontario announced that it would reform the Mining Act on July 14th. Okay? So it's pretty clear that the final Court of Appeal decision was a key push for Ontario to consider rewriting the Mining Act. <coughs> the amendment to the Mining Act was passed in October 2009. Aboriginal consultation will be required. Pardon me. <coughs> and any... Um, arrangements made between mining companies and the communities have to be considered before permits to conduct certain exploration activities will be granted by the government. The specifics of Aboriginal consultation and which activities will require consultation are yet to be set out in the regulations. Okay, now provisions for consultation accommodation in the Mining Act are clearly an improvement over what it was before and this will be helpful to those First Nations who decide to allow mining exploration on their land because it will allow them uh, greater shares in any economic benefits as well as some opportunities to preserve or protect certain parts of their territories. Although this is an improvement, it maintains the conditions for conflict. It assumes that all communities will agree with exploration and it assumes again that all exercise of Aboriginal treaty rights can be accommodated in the exploration plan. This is doubtful. The Mining Act maintains the free entry system that was critiqued by the Court of Appeal. Ontario still allows prospectors to stake mining claims without talking to First Nations communities. Once a claim is filed, the company can conduct early exploration work, again without being required to directly notify or consult with First Nations. So recording a mining claim still creates, at minimum, a legally recognizable interest in the ability to prospect on the land. This interest, because it's exclusive against all other prospectors, and because it might lead to finding minerals, creates, in the minds of prospectors, something more solid, a right to explore and a right to the minerals beneath if they're there. Prospecting is a really speculative activity. Basically, investors bet on finding enough minerals or enough tests that predict minerals to sell the claims to a mining developer. Once a company stakes the claim, a gold rush mindset develops which pushes the company to engage in as much exploration activity as it can, even if that means ignoring First Nations rights. Okay. Having consultation and accommodation before prospectors can stake claims would come closer to addressing the source of the conflict. Land that was especially important could be withdrawn from staking, for example. In this way, Ontario could recognize constitutionally protected Aboriginal treaty rights before any third party interests are established on the land. Yet, consultation accommodation as envisaged by the courts, with no veto, cannot lead towards reconciliation. It loses its meaningfulness and the tendency is for it to become a bureaucratic process. On the consultation regulations being worked um, on in the ministry right now um, envisage a kind of a, a graduated process where the ministry decides, oh, that sounds like it's an activity that will impact Aboriginal treaty rights, so we better have consultation. Or, when they look at the mining exploration plan, they say, oh, that probably won't be an impact, and so accommodation and consultation aren't required. Okay, so it's becoming, it's moving in that direction. Consultation accommodation cannot resolve the real issues of who decides land use on First Nations traditional territories. It tends to center Crown visions of land use, and it treats First Nations communities' visions of land as subordinate to Crown visions. Okay, so what happened with Platinex <laughs> in the meanwhile? 
At the end of August in 2009, just before the new Mining Act was passed into law, Platinex tried to access KI's traditional territory for exploration by float plane. The KI community members circled in motorboats and canoes on the lake, preventing the plane from landing. In December 2009, Platinex was compensated with $5 million to give up its mining claims in the Big Trout Lake area and drop a lawsuit it had filed against Ontario. Ontario withdrew the land that Platinex had mining claims on in KI's traditional territory from open staking, but reserved the right to unilaterally reopen them. If another company ever develops a mine there, Platinex will get a 2.5% royalty. While this is a partial victory for KI in that those lands around Nimigwisibin's Lake are unlikely to be explored or mined in the near future, KI is left basically in the same position that it started in. It's left maintaining the same misunderstood treaty rights over its traditional territory that were ignored at the beginning of the dispute by Ontario and Platinex. Companies can still stake claims on First Nation on KI's territory. Um, other than that, area that was withdrawn. Beginning last fall, in fact, God's Lake Resources was visiting its claims within KI's traditional territory um, on an old mine site that had been abandoned in the 1940s. They were developing plans to drill without any consultation with KI. There are burials of community members in the area and other sacred and cultural sites. KI asked God's Lake Resources to leave and they ignored this. Recently, God's Lake Resources was making arrangements to hire private security to accompany their drilling rig to the site. It looks very much like a rerun of the Platinex dispute. So what do we learn? What do we learn about the role of law in this dispute? It's really important to remember that KI did not choose to go to court. By calling on the court, Platinex shifted the terrain of um, expressive protest and Aboriginal rights from KI territory under the treaty to these ideas, these private ideas of injunctions and damages between, between sort of um, uh, private parties. KI felt, however, that they had to defend themselves against this lawsuit, which was meant to threaten community solidarity and disrupt the relationship with the land. The adversarial legal system is not often a chosen path for those working towards Aboriginal self-determination, although it may be a last resort, and sometimes it's chosen. It takes a lot of money, community, and personal resources. Despite 16 years of Supreme Court rulings explaining that prior and honourable consultation is required before the government can do something that infringes Aboriginal rights, not to mention 26 years of Section 35, Ontario failed to do this in mining exploration. The small, impoverished community of KI was put in the position of trying to force Ontario's well-resourced bureaucracy to fulfil, at a bare minimum, its legal duties to consult and accommodate. While the court was able to recognise KI's attachment to the land for a short time, the court lost this understanding, limiting its response. Legal decisions in Canada's system, in Canada's adversarial system, clarify who's in a position of power and who is not. Legal decisions sometimes vindicate the powerless and sometimes protect those in need of protection. Sometimes legal recognition of certain arguments can contribute to a long-term change, um, such as the recognition of Aboriginal title in the Calder case in 1973, or the openness to even having an injunction in the first decision in KI. Just recently, um, another injunction was granted in, uh, in the far north of Ontario against a company that, um, that did not consult and accommodate uh, the local First Nation. Once again, the local First Nation had to take that company to court. Um, I don't see the first decision in 2006 as a victory. Um, it is one case in its recognition of First Nations law that might make a difference. However, slowing Platinex's drilling allowed time in which to build broader political support. First Nations political organizations, um, such as Anishinaabe Aski Nation and the Assembly of First Nations, environmental, non-governmental organizations and other supporters of Aboriginal self-determination were able to build on the judge's statements that mining exploration could irreparably harm First Nations communities' connections to the land. Okay, so that's, that's an opening for some kind of action that might eventually lead to changing in the law. Overall, however, the law tends to support the status quo and those who have power retain it in court. The second decision 
in its inability to legally recognize KI's relationship with the land upheld the status quo that denies First Nations um, jurisdiction. This clarification of the status quo, however, when it's seen as unjust, can contribute to social action that might lead to, uh, to social change. Now the final Court of Appeal decision in KI and Platinex understood the actions of the KI-6 and Bob Lovelace as reflecting reasonable interpretations of Section 35. This is another step towards real recognition of Aboriginal traditional laws as having a significant role to play in reconstructing Aboriginal relations with the government in Canada. I think that what's important is that when courts get involved, the conflict that was kind of underlying becomes highly visible. KI's own law became visible to the broader society. And sometimes the visibility of the conflict can work in favor of Aboriginal peoples. The KI-6 and Bob Lovelace became known as political prisoners and prisoners of conscience. This in a country that is apparently known across the world as democratic and respectful of human rights. This was no longer a private dispute over access to land. Platinex's invocation of the blunt instrument of Canadian law revealed its own carelessness in its approach to exploration on KI's territory. It revealed the reluctance of Ontario to fulfill its constitutional duties. And finally, it revealed the grave injustice of jailing protesters who had constitutional rights, okay, that weren't being respected. So law's political role becomes highlighted there. And if power over is exer exercised against justice, as we see in this case of the jailing, then of jailing Aboriginal people who are fighting for their rights, people do speak out. Um, maintaining social awareness of the continuing wrongs and vocal support for political change is necessary work to make the slim openings provided by law worth the effort and the deep personal sacrifice that they cost. Okay? So without that tie to political action, I think that Canadian law offers a very limited and slow process of change. Okay. Now I just want to um, update you a little bit here. KI remains committed to community self-determination and the right to say no to development, okay? Despite the incursions of God's Lake resources and Ontario's reluctance to engage with the community. This is part of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which Canada finally signed, free, prior, and informed consent before um, undertaking development activity on traditional lands. Another thing that KI has done is it's asserted, it's, it's reasserted its traditional laws in setting out a watershed declaration and a new consultation protocol. These received overwhelming support in a community referendum in July 2011. In these documents, the community relies on the principles of Kanawandandaki to express their spiritual attachment to and purpose and responsibility in protecting their lands. The watershed declaration explains the spiritual connection that the community has to Big Trout Lake and takes responsibility for the lake. They say, we declare all water that flows into and out of Big Trout Lake and all lands whose waters flow into those lakes, rivers and streams to be completely protected through our continued care under KI's authority, laws and protocols. Indigenous traditional laws are living in many places in Canada. KI is asserting its jurisdiction in its traditional territory, stating its perspective on what it would like its relationship with Ontario to be through its own laws. KI's jurisdiction and its exercise of that jurisdiction is the source of its rights in Canadian law. If Ontario and Canada take Section 35 seriously, they're going to have to ask the hard questions about their own jurisdiction and where it comes from. If there is a will towards reconciliation, towards building new relationships between Canadian governments and Aboriginal peoples, Canada and Ontario need to respond to KI's traditional laws with respect and recognition. The end.